Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the afternoon of March 9th, and we are continuing to take uh, testimony and not take testimony, mark up and uh, hopefully vote this afternoon on H-171, the child care bill. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully you were able to get out and get uh, a couple of minutes of sunshine if the sun is shining where you are. Um, that would be that would have been nice to be able to do. Um, so welcome back. Um, we have uh, continued to work at uh, refining some language um, during the during the um, break. Uh, and I'm just looking to see, is Katie on? Katie is here, okay. Um, Katie, I'm just wondering if you might uh, review the, the language around the, um, the, the end user committee um, that we worked on and um, uh, then I'll uh, ask Representative Whitman to maybe share a couple of thoughts about that. Sure, I'm trying to scroll to the right place right now. Let me share my screen. Where, where do we find this? Uh, is this is the updated version on our page, Katie? Yeah, um, I'm Katie still, five. yeah, work from um, draft 5.3. It hasn't changed. I've renumbered my document. Um, this is my kind of internal document, um, not an official draft. So let's see. Okay. Is it more? Is it confusing to have my language up on the screen, or do you prefer if I just take it down and you use a second device to review um, the language? Uh, I think it, it's helpful here because we, this language is not actually in the five point three version that we have on committee. It's on the page. Is that right? Uh, no, I haven't made any changes from right. five point three to this section. Right. So this, let's let's keep it up on the on the page so that um, the public can see it. Okay, um, so this is the, um, I'm in section five about the Bright Futures Information System. And in subdivision two, there is language about a, um, an end user group to review the rollout of the new um, BFIS system. And so the language in 5.3, and again, it remains un, unchanged, um, is that by August 1st of this coming year, the division is to convene and consult with, a bright, with the Bright Futures Information System end user group composed of child care providers, eligibility specialists from community child care support agencies and families participating in CCFAP. The division shall provide monthly updates to the end user group regarding the division's progress in completing the modernization project and any successes or challenges identified once the system is operational and the division shall actively seek advice and feedback from the end user group regarding the system. And the group shall be dissolved August 1, 2022. So this is 5.3 that has been posted on the website as of this morning. And this does not contain any um, changes that were um, discussed today. Okay. Um, so, uh, Representative Whitman, um, there you are, okay. <laughs> uh, would you uh, please just, uh, oh, I see uh, Representative McFawn, your hand is up. Did you have uh, a question? No. Okay. No. I'm taking Thank it you. down. Thank Madam you. Vice Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, uh, Representative Whitman, could you um, just review uh, some thoughts that you've had about this, and then we will take a look at some proposed revised language for that section that Katie just went through. Yep. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, yeah, so if we remember the reason we added this end user group in the first place was receiving some testimony from child care providers. We heard from a lot of people that they had not been contacted or included in the development of the first module of the BFIS uh, system. So we wanted to just ensure that we had language saying that providers, family members uh, would be included in the development. Um, the change that we're suggesting is that the August 1st, 2022 date for the group to end is extended out to completion of the entire system. 
um, that August 1st, 2022 would align with only the first module being completed. Um, but we understood that other modules that could be completed in the future would also be relevant for providers, family members to be involved in. Um, so we just wanted to, I'm, I'm suggesting uh, that we change uh, that date from August 1st, 2022 to um, full functionality of the Bright Futures information system. So Representative Whitman, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's um, the committee had agreed that we should have an end user group um, after hearing testimony. Uh, and what you're suggesting is that we're not necessarily specific about a date when that ends, but when the full functionality of the new and improved uh, BFIS system or whatever it will be called um, is achieved, that that's when the end user group um, will cease to exist. Is that essentially what you're um, suggesting? Yeah, and a little bit more context about the modules. Um, the first module is going to be CCFAP. Um, the other three modules that we're looking at completing in the long term, we don't have an end date yet, um, which is why we're keeping the language kind of vague, is um, licensing, workforce development, and children's integrated services. So um, we have reason to believe that providers, families would also be interested in looking at, say, licensing uh, workforce development just so that they can have access to that information um, mm -hmm. and have a say in how it's developed from their user end. Um, and we also, um, I'd also like to suggest adding uh, just one phrase to uh, the people that are included in these end user groups. Um, to include providers, eligibility specialists, families participating, and any other relevant stakeholders. Just kind of a catch-all statement in case if we want somebody from Children's Integrated Services to be included. It's just the idea that um, we have an active end-user group throughout the implementation of BFIS. And uh, what you're suggesting is allowing some flexibility there with regard to who is Oh, excuse me, who is on that group. Okay. Yep. Um, all right, so let's take uh, a couple of questions and then we'll have Katie put up um, uh, the suggested revised language. And uh, Sarah Truckle, I think you were first and then Representative McFawn. Uh, yeah, Sarah Truckle, DCF Financial Director for the record. Um, I guess I would first start, um, CIS is not included in the BFIS data system. Um, in our current or in our planned existing data system. I'm also not sure where those particular modules came from um, because there's obviously a lot of components to the current existing system and a lot of architecture that's been mapped, but that isn't uh, kind of consistent with, with how we obviously have to go through procurement in different pieces and um, haven't mapped all of those different pieces yet because we're just focused on the first module. So would want to clarify that. Um, we did in addition over the break, uh, identify per Representative McFawn, the kind of areas of the bill that we uh, wanted to highlight. And we too highlighted this section as um, somewhere where we would you know, recommend some different language. So if, if now is a good time to have that discussion, we're happy to do so. Or if you'd like us to wait, we are also happy to do that as well. Um, Sarah, thank you. Um, and uh, why don't we um, wait for just a second to see what the um, uh, first set of revised language is, and then we'll look at uh, your uh, thoughts and feedback about, about this section as well. Is that okay? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, Representative McFawn. Representative McFawn, you have your hand up. Got to get my thing unmuted. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I have, I have the same question that was just asked. Maybe it's in a different way. <clears throat> Where did the uh, the modules that um, Representative Whitman just mentioned? Where did they come from? Where, where, is, where is that information? That is from reviewing, uh, if I may, uh, Madam Vice Chair, yeah. um, 
That's from reviewing my notes from the energy and technology uh, meeting that we had. I thought I actually received it from Sarah Truckle. Um, so maybe I missed it. Um, but that's, that's where I did get that those three modules uh, named. So, um, thank, thank you, Representative Whitman. Um, I, I think that um, it's, it's probably actually not even as critical, those the modules aren't named in this section, so I don't think we really need to get sort of caught up in what modules they are and what their names are or what they cover. Um, I think the concept here is that the um, that the um, user group would the end user group would remain in effect until the completion of the system, um, whatever that system entails. So. Um, I see Madam Chair is back. Um, welcome back, Madam, Madam Chair. We were just about to look at um, the suggested revised language for this section. And then uh, Sarah Truckel also has some comments from the department about this section. Cool. Well, please go I ahead. Have, I haven't finished yet. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative McFawn. I thought right. that was it. That's OK. Sorry. Um, if the, I thought that Representative <clears throat> Whitman was asking to include them in the and then no my the only the only uh i was not saying to that was just context for why um my suggestion is to simply say that we continue having an end user group period period because other components of the bfis upgrade beyond ccfap are likely helpful for providers okay. to be involved in Okay, and um, uh, when you named all that, the families, you, you gave a whole laundry list of people. That's currently uh, in the language. That's in there. And also, um, Building Bright Futures has a catch-all <laughs> phrase that they use. Anybody else that they think something to that? Anybody else they think <clears throat> they would benefit from having them on there? So both ways, you we should be able to get what we want. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank uh, you. Madam Vice Chair, now you can turn this meeting over to Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, Representative McFawn. Um, and I will do so. And uh, Katie, I think it's okay now for you to go ahead and put up the um, suggested revisions to the language. I think it will make it clear for people what it is that is currently being suggested. Sure. I think I have the wrong document. Hang on. There we go. Um, so here's the language and the changes that Representative Whitman just proposed are highlighted in yellow. So it expands the participants of the end user group to any other relevant stakeholders. And instead of having the end user group um, being dissolved on August um, 2022, it now reads that the end user group shall be dissolved following the full functionality of all components of the system. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> and I <clears throat> thank you and thank you, uh, Representative Wood and committee for for starting. Um, are there further questions as it relates to this language and this section about the BFIS group? BFIS. Are we okay Madam with here? I think. Didn't, uh, didn't Sarah Truckle have something that she wanted to say? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Is now an appropriate time, Madam Chair? Abs absolutely, I couldn't find you. N no worries. Um, we too highlighted the language around um, having that end user group uh, go to the completion. So we appreciate that. Um, we also identified that um, we would continue to stress that that October 1st language, um, we would recommend that that be stricken based on that it's subject to our third party vendor. And we we have, uh, obviously we're managing a pandemic and we can't predict the potential for unforeseen obstacles, but are uh, moving forward with that October 1st date and the development timeframe. We would also recommend shifting from monthly reporting to periodically reporting. And the reason for this is we would tie that to things like our um, development 
sprints or um, other required milestones. So there's going to be specific parts that our vendor identifies where end users have to be identified and worked with. And we're not sure if that'll be monthly, it could be weekly. There's points where we do daily sprints and development projects. So um, didn't, didn't want to tie our hands with a monthly reporting, but wanted to really say, obviously, the vendor has to work with people as required. Um, so would just recommend doing uh, periodic reporting. Um, and then the other thing that we would highlight is because the first module is going to come online with the current existing system, the current existing system is named Bright Futures Information System. Um, so it's a little confusing when we're also talking about this new or the modernized system. So just didn't know if uh, we would just recommend a way to either kind of clarify that it's the modernized project or a new system. Um, to just provide some clarity, but our big point here is just uh, the continued recommendation to strike B1, uh, given that it's not something within the department's uh, sole control due to vendor and contracts, and quite frankly, the pandemic. Um, Sarah, I guess I have a question for the department. <clears throat> This is a goal. This is your North Star in terms of uh, this. So what's going to happen if you don't, what, what is the department concerned about happening if um, the pandemic wor wor worsens so you can't move forward or the, um, <clears throat> the, the contractor falls, falls short? So wh what is the um, fear of having a um, a wished for date, which you have, but which you don't know, which is always the possibility won't happen. I can provide kind of some general thoughts. And then um, I know Ledge Council also identified this. I think the way the language is currently written provides that it um, it requires the Department for Children and Families Child Development Division shall ensure <laughs> Um, full functionality of that first module. And um, I, I could see an example being all of the development team uh, comes down with COVID and is offline for eight weeks. That could put us significantly behind. And um, that would not be something within our control that we could mitigate or do anything about. Um, so, so what will our, we do? I mean, so what will, I mean, so, so that happens. What, what, what are you afraid that we're going, what, what, what's the concern? Or whether it's you or if Katie, if Ledge Council has the same concern, help us understand what is, um, um, what, uh, what is so awful, with all due respect, I, I can't tell you how many times I get, little, I get requests for the reports won't get in on time, we need an extension on this, um, and that that's happens on a regular, and I well go, I'll go okay fine mix. So I, I don't understand the resistance to the date. So from our end, we're already under that immense pressure, obviously with the federal requirements. So mm -hmm. we have we have that pressure again. I would defer to Katie on the potential that it creates some some um, potential liability for the state. I think she had highlighted that in an earlier testimony, Katie. Yes. <laughs> um, so I've thought a lot about this language, particularly um, over the past week, and I, I reached out to some, some colleagues for their thoughts. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure what the exact remedy would be if, if this was challenged. Um, you know, it could be actual damages for um, the amount that a, a family um, would have received if the, if the system was in place. Another thought that I had, and I'm not sure how this would be carried out within the agency, but could there be a challenge to the human, I believe it's the human services board, and I'm not exactly sure what that would look like or what the remedy would be in that case. Um, so in my mind, it's sort of an open question as to, um, you know, if it, if it could be challenged and what the remedy would look like as a result of a challenge. Uh, Representative Gregoire. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to thank Sarah Chuckle and Katie for that. Um, that's what I said a week ago, that there would be issues potentially of liability. So thank you for that. 
So committee, what is your um, pleasure? Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, where, where are um, in in the contract with the contractor? Um, there's going to be uh, th this is one of the this was going to be part of the contract, wasn't it? The October first date. I mean, part of the contract would be to build towards that date. And if the contractor doesn't meet it, then there's probably going to be some repercussions in terms of um, do they get paid or not? If they if they've got a timeline that they have to follow, that's and, and that's how the contract you make sure you get get it done on a certain time. If if this October date, if if the department had to have it done fully functional by a certain date, would that not back into the contract? <clears throat> you, last time we talked about this, you were talking about negotiating with the um, contractor. So how do we fix it so that we, we all win? Um, I, Representative McFawn, I believe that the um, suggestion from the department is to just delete that whole section. Is that correct? Sarah, is that correct? That's correct. And to answer Representative McFawn's earlier question, we did include the October 1st within our RFP and it's right. how we're currently framing, you know, our contract negotiations and the timelines that we're identifying right. internally. But um, there are different provisions in contracts. Um, so I, I, until those contracts are finalized, <laughs> I can't tell you what the, the repercussion would be other than um, we are, as we've said, operating under a pandemic at this point too, which just creates this whole level of um, complexity and uncertainty. I mean, I mean, the example I think that's most poignant is if our entire development team got COVID, what, yeah. what would that do to the project? So you have the data in the RFP. <clears throat> so the contractor knows what you're expecting them to do. Right, that was the date that we put out and that's the date that we've been working under and that is as we've evaluated all of the different timelines, our expectation. So if we added a phrase, something like this, um, on or before October 1st, 2021, and, and somehow putting in something that said uh, extenuating, notwithstanding extenuating circumstances, would that solve the problem? Would that take care of everybody getting COVID or, or any other kind of thing you can think of that might get in the way? I would want to have our general counsel look at it from a, a legal liability standpoint with regards to the Human Services Board, um, but I'm not the, the legal representation for the department, but I recognize that what you're trying to achieve is, you know, some, some common ground around those extenuating circumstances. We already have that October 1st deadline required by our federal partners. So for us, it, it's not something that we're not already really under pressure for. And if we don't achieve, we face the potential for those financial penalties, which are sizable. So we, we really internally feel that we already have that pressure and we're working towards that goal and it's consistent with our 22 budget proposal. Representative McFawn, that's a helpful suggestion. Keep that in there. And uh, Re uh, Representative Brumstead has her hand up as well. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Sarah. I, um, I, that's what I was thinking is that the other big requirement here is that the federal government does um, have the ability to um, withdraw or somehow their, their ability to make us pay for um, not meeting that deadline is uh, pretty strong. Um, so one of the things I wondered is what if we said 
shall set the goal for full functionality of the first module instead of ensure, since it's like the North Star. <laughs> That's the goal. I don't know if we can do that in legislation. Katie would be able to tell us better. But I was trying to just think of a better word than ensure, since even legislative council is a little concerned with the language. Okay. Although I, I would be supportive of keeping it just because we know the feds are making are going to push us on this too. But <clears throat> aside, putting that aside, is there a better word or a better way that we can express legislative intent to get this done by October 1st? Um, thank you, Representative Brumstead. It sounds like you and Representative McFawn are <clears throat> sort of in this are moving in the same direction, which is to keep section um, five, number B1 in the bill, but to somehow soften the sentence that says shall ensure. Um, my question to the, um, thank you, um, Sarah, for um, being so clear. And um, thank you, Katie, for adding um, to that and to having thought about that. Um, what is your um, thoughts about <clears throat> whether it's putting in a something similar to what Representative McFawn said in terms of absent unexpected extenuating circumstances or something similar <clears throat> to um, you know, a goal and maybe Representative Wood has a third or different suggestion. Representative Wood. Uh, no, I don't have a third or different suggestion. I was just uh, uh, giving you a response to your question. I was, <laughs> I should have waited till you were finished asking it before I put my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. So, uh, but thank you. So that's, I mean, so let me find out from the committee if that is the direction that you want us to go. The soften. That, I was going to say that was that was that was what I um, had my hand up about. I think it's still important to keep it in there, the the date. But I think that um, you know something along the lines of you know what Representative uh, McFawn or Brumstead have said. Uh, you know, I would for me, I would be okay with that. Thank you, thank you, Representative Wood, Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. Yes, I I agree with uh, Representative. McFawn, and to some extent with uh, Representative Brumstead, well, her comment about the North Star or something like that, I agree. We should probably come up with some better language. That, uh, and as far as Representative McFawn's concern, uh, my concern is the 10%, you know, is what is recommended by a group of people. But I don't know if we've really fleshed out that that is really the right number uh, for the future or not. To me, it seems like a relatively low number, and I think I brought that up before. And I would rather that we possibly use it as, a, you know, what do you want to call it, a goal, but not say we shall do this. Okay, I think that's very, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, proactive language that should not be in here. And I think it would help uh, get this bill through over the over the hurdle at the end, if that was not in there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Rosenquist. And we can go back to that second comment um, later. Right now, we're gonna focus on the, if you don't mind, on this one piece around the um, BFIS system, as I believe what I walked into the discussion about. Um, and I've heard you say that you're on board um, with Katie figuring out a way how to soften the sentence, as is um, Teresa and what I understand, uh, Representative Wood and what I understand, Representative McFawn. So I am looking to, okay, Representative Paye is like, okay. Um, uh, I'm, can people, um, I'm not, I certainly can't read people's. Madam Chair, why don't yes. we just ask the question? Who does okay. not want to do that? Okay, who does not want to do that? Please raise your hand. 
I just need to know, make sure I know what it is that we're not doing. <clears throat> Who does not want to soften the sentence, lack of a better term, on section five, number B, around the October 1st date for um, the BFIS system? And um, the question was, who does not? And uh, Representative Whitman is raising his hand that he does not want to soften it. I, I might qualify that, if I may, Madam Chair. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I think um, I'm not opposed to softening the language. I just think we need to be careful about how we do it, given that there are federal requirements that we don't put in language that somehow says that we can relax our federal requirements. So I would say that maybe setting a goal makes sense, but saying that if something happens, we don't need to follow it. I'm a little bit less comfortable with, with that suggestion. Okay, thank you. Um, I am not seeing any other hands. Um, Katie, do you have enough to go on? Sure, I think I do. Um, I think probably the way to do it is to change the verb from ensure to something else. Um, something like shall seek to achieve or shall aim for full functionality or make every diligent effort to achieve full functionality, something, something in, along those lines. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, I walked into this meeting late. Were we um, focused on the BFIS? Have we gone to the, um, I would think the next piece is uh, the um, language um, and the work that was done <clears throat> um, by the, um, around the financial study. Do we have something, um, Katie, to uh, Representative Whitman? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just while we're still on BFIS, I was wondering okay. if we could address the um, suggestion from Sarah Truckle to change monthly to periodic. Oh. Um, I would be supportive of that personally. I don't know how the rest of the committee feels. Um, folks, um, who is, <clears throat> you have a thumbs up from Representative Rosenquist. I'm going to end from Representative Small and Representative Wood, Representative Noyes. Okay, um, I, we have a majority. Um, Sarah, you got one thing. <laughs> and then Madam Chair, there is also a suggestion to clarify somehow that we're talking about the new system, not the current BFIS system being fully functional. Um, I don't know if Katie has an easy solution to that to suggest, but I, I would also support that for this section. Uh, re thank you, Representative Whitman. Uh, Representative Brumstead. I think the way that I've heard it referred to in the past is the modernized BFIS system. Is that right, Sarah? <laughs> we haven't chosen a, a specific name yet, but I know we've talked about it as um, the modernization plan or the, the new system. Um, I think maybe there's just an eloquent way of just delineating that particular, you know, even if it's just the modernized plan. Which and we is, have that in line seven, we say, uh, the end user group regarding the division's progress in completing the modernization project and any successes or challenges identified once, <clears throat> then we do it wrong in the next sentence, right? <laughs> and in the first sentence. Um, oh, no, you say the Bright Futures Modernization Plan. Plan, yeah. <clears throat> I see the words modernization project. Maybe that's a, a good term for now in light of, just because now the systems are gonna run concurrently, we didn't wanna have confusion. Okay, so you would suggest on um, page four, 
instead of bright futures information system modernization plan you would suggest modernization project or whatever it is yeah okay uh, and then um, wait a minute. I'm sorry, Legislative Council has her hand up. <laughs> she gets to go first. Would it be okay to just use the term modernized Bright Futures Information System? Because it's not a plan. I mean, it's a system. It's a, um, could we just use modernized as, you know, as a modifier before references? Does that work? I, I think that would meet our needs and just we haven't identified what we plan to name that system. So. <laughs> Obviously, that'll be a component in the future, but for the purposes of this, it will clearly identify that it's the new system that we're developing. Thank okay. You. Thank you. And uh, Representative Whitman, thank, thank you for having us circle back before we moved on incompletely. Um, I be believe that the um, last sort of uh, I believe that what we have in front of us is to um, it is to to get the language to to look at language that was modifying or um, editing the uh, financial study section. Um, I don't believe we've heard the fiscal note from Nolan, um, and uh, Sarah, are there other? I imagine there are other pieces of feedback that you have from the department. Okay, um, committee, um, it is two o'clock. We can't leave today until we vote this bill out. Um, so Katie, how much time when we, when all is said and done, how much time will you need to provide us with um, a copy that we can, or a you know, whatever, a version that we can vote on? I've been making changes as we go. So you could vote on, on the draft I have, which is 6.1. Uh, if you want an edited draft, it would take longer. However, while we're talking, if we're closing out sections, I can start sending them to the editors now to get them reviewed while you continue to talk. For example, if we've just closed out five, I'll send that one to the editors now so we can keep moving. Okay, that sounds perfect. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> did, we, did we change the monthly to periodic or not? Yes, we did. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, can we move on to um, the uh, fiscal study, the fiscal analysis? I believe there is new language. And I'm not sure who is presenting that. Is that, are you? That was, are you that would be me. Okay, Nolan, thank you. For the fiscal, are you talking about the fiscal note or the financing? Like, the financing, fin I'm sorry, not the fiscal note, the finance oh, okay. study. That's not me. That's not you. Um, is that, is that Katie? Is that I think that's Roy? me. Oh, that's um, Katie. Okay. Um, this is a, a joint effort between myself and Joyce. Um, so Joyce, I don't know if you're there, but jump in if I misspeak. Um, let me first scroll on my document to where the language is and then I'll share it. So we're in section 12. And Joyce and I um, are suggesting a rewrite of the introductory language. Okay, here it is. And, and I believe um, that uh, part of the... <clears throat> that uh, Jessica, that Representative Brumstead um, and Representative Wood were part of the discussion or um, as well as there was some discussion with um, uh, Let's Grow Kids. Is that correct or not? I, I, yes, there was email traffic between myself and Representatives Wood and Brumstead. Okay. Um, okay. So um, just to take a step back, um, we the new language is obviously in yellow. So the concept here was to emphasize that the financing study is really focused on birth through age five, but also have kind of a recognition that you can't make changes or really review um, the system birth through age five without recognizing that there is an intersection 
with childcare for older children, as well as impacts on the system um, for older children. Um, and also recognizing that there's been substantial work already done or in process by the um, Universal After School Task Force. So that's what this language aims to do is kind of right up front, kind of set the framework of what the financing study is looking at. So um, the language now reads um, that by September 1st of this coming year, JFO is to contract with a consultant with expertise in the field of childcare and early childhood education to examine the economic impacts of and potential funding mechanisms to adjust Vermont's existing childcare system for children from birth through five years of age with consideration given to the intersection of and impacts of childcare for children from six years of age through 12 years of age in alignment with the recommendations of the Universal After School Task Force. And then there's a cross-reference to where that task force was created in statute. The work of the consultant shall be governed by the following goals. These goals are the same with the exception um, that in draft 5.3, this subdivision one regarding the 10% um, specified that it was for ages birth through age five. That language has been removed as it is now captured in the introduction language. Should I leave this language up or should I, is it easier to see folks if I take it down? Um. Maybe for right now, can you keep it up as we sure. um, talk about um, this? When we went on, <clears throat> when we broke for the floor <clears throat> and caucus and lunch and the joint assembly, uh, there was discussion um, and some desire to more clearly outline or meld what was going um, on between the after school and the goals of this. So let me, um, Representative Wood, I believe you had some questions initially, um, Representative Brumstead, and um, where are you with this language? Madam Chair? Yeah. Um, I, I uh... I was one of the um, people who um, felt like we needed to address the age six to age 12 and somehow incorporate this after school task, the, the things that will be coming forward from the after school task force. And I feel like this language for me does that, um, still gives the priority for what we're considering, but um, that, that the consultants will also need to consider the impacts in, um, you know, for great for years um, six through twelve, as well as the work of the ta the after school task force. So um, I appreciate the work of um, JFO and our ledge council in crafting this revised language. Thank you, um, Representative Brumstead and Representative um, Paella. I agree with um, with everything that Representative Wood just said, and also just curious. I'd like to know what Amy Schollenberger thinks. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, that that that's next. I'm, okay. I'm, this then, is a, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. I just was going to explain why that the whole that whole piece is important, and then below this, we had also had highlighted C. Did we keep C? Um, Katie in here, I just wondered if you lifted that up a little. Sure, so there are additional questions I have for the committee. Um, and I wasn't sure if you wanted to look at this piece and make a decision, but- um, that, well, because... that, was, that was my goal. That was okay. my goal okay. that we take this- They sort of all fit together, but okay, yeah. that's fine. I'll wait. <laughs> I'm good with the upper piece. Okay. Um, Representative um, Paella, since you are co-chair of the- um, after school task force, does this fit thus far? Yes, sir. Yes, they believe that it does. Thank you. Representative McFawn. I agree with the changes. Thank you. Um, uh, 
Amy Schulenberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this is a more elegant way to do what we were trying to do before. It looks fine to me. Okay. Um, uh, Sarah Truckle, um, how about we save your comments to this section when we finish the whole section? Does that make sense? Sarah Truckle? Yes, that makes sense, Madam Chair. Okay. And this is consistent with what we previously identified with the family copay issue. So, okay, that's great. <clears throat> okay, Katie. So my question was, um, we referenced the Universal After School Task Force up above in the introductory language. Are we, referen are we referencing it a second time still um, in this subsection C? This is taking into consideration the analysis of the Blue Ribbon Commission and the Universal After School Task Force, the consultant's evaluation shall. shall. Um, so I'm curious if we're keeping that reference a second time. While you're thinking about that, um, I'll scroll down to show you the next piece. Um, in draft 5.3 that we looked through this morning, um, there is this subdivision two that describes what will be in the consultant's report. The consultant is to submit um, the following results. And in subdivision B, um, we had language um, identify and determine the feasibility of implementing a stable long-term funding, um, sorry, identify and determine the feasibility of implementing stable long-term funding sources to finance an affordable, high-quality early child care system for children from birth through five years of age, given child care's role in post-pandemic stimulus and long-term economic development. So this highlighted language was in the draft that we looked at this morning, 5.3, and we had it here um, because initially the whole section applied to um, families with children birth through age 12. And we were doing a kind of a carve out here specific to um, birth through age five. Now that we've changed the lead in language to be more focused on this group, birth through age five, I'm wondering if the committee would still like to retain this language or if this language is no longer necessary in your opinion. Is there a problem with having it? Um, besides repetition, um, um, Katie. Uh, uh, but now I see Joyce. I'll, I'll, <laughs> make, I'll see Joyce and let uh, uh, Joint Fiscal re uh, respond. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Joyce Manchester, Joint Fiscal Office. So the question here is whether the committee wants the consultant to offer ideas about financing the after school program for children six through 12, or whether the committee wants the consultant to focus only on financing the um, early care and education system for children zero through five. So if the committee wants to accept the after school task force and their financing methods and just say, that's what it's going to be and that's the end of the story, then they should focus on the zero through five financing. If they want to, if the committee wants to say, well, we're hiring this consultant, maybe it makes sense to have them look at the overall picture, both zero to five and the after school financing. So that's, in my opinion, this is a committee choice. Okay. Um, Representative McFawn, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think one affects the other. I think they should both be in there. So, um, Representative McFawn, what you are um, at proposing is that the highlighted language be removed, or that the, or that it be added to the after school. Is that what you are suggesting? Well, what I'm suggesting is. Uh, we, I, I per, this is my own personal opinion. We, we need to go from uh, zero 
to 12 years old. We're, we're talking about the consultant um, taking into consideration what the uh, Kelly's committee does. And they're gonna be finished before the consultant. So he's gonna have, or she's gonna have that information. And, and so I, I say that um, we should have it read up to 12 years old. It includes all of them. That's what we're trying to find out. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> Representative Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm wondering if there might be um, a solution similar to what we had earlier, where we keep the highlighted section um, to state that it's mainly for children from birth through five years of age, but we add with consideration of the after school task forces findings um, so that the consultant can uh, not sort of duplicate their efforts, but yeah, focus on zero to five in case of uh, they wanna keep the after school task forces financing plan uh, independent. Um, thank you. Um, Representative um, Paella, could you, um, you, you spoke about what is the purpose of the after school um, committee that you are co-chair of. What is the outcome? Well, so we're still working on the outcome, so I don't want to be too specific about what is in the, the final result because we don't have it yet. But um, I, in regard to this conversation, I guess I'm a little worried about duplicating efforts. Um, and I think um, that what we are currently thinking at or, or looking at is that there would be different uh, long-term funding streams for the different age groups. Um, even, even though there there is the CCSAP where there is interplay between the two. Um, so I'm not as concerned that this bill um, also be what proposes a long-term funding source for after school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I don't think that there was, I don't think that we were envisioning that there would be yeah. one source that would fund all, all of it. Thank you. Um, uh, And just for the committee to remember this bill as it was introduced, focused on, for lack of a better term, early care and education. And our goals relate to early care and education as it relates to um, cost to families. Um, Sarah Truckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. We would just highlight that the area of crossover, as we said earlier, is the family copay. So to the extent that the that CCFAP includes the regulated after school system, families are going to have that uh, family copay for six through 12 under the CCFAP redesign. Um, and, and this language uh, conflicts with that kind of move that we're making. Um, and could obviously defer to Melissa around, it is just a slice of the after school, but it is really the regulated system of care that we're talking about for six through 12, where we, we have that uh, funding mechanism being through CCFAP. So um, didn't know if that was helpful context as you're discussing this language. Okay, so um, Sarah, what you are concerned about is what is on our screen right right now, which is to identify and determine the feasibility of implementing a stable long-term funding source for an affordable, high quality, early child care system for children birth through five. 
to the extent that the regulated system extends through 12 um, through CCFAP. So not all after school is included in that, but the um, just like family child care home providers have both birth through five uh, children in their care as well as after school children in their care. And all of those children may receive CCFAP as a financing mm -hmm. mechanism. Um, thank you. Um, my, um, I, there are lots of hands up. Um, Katie, I, I need, because I'm looking at 5.1. So I, this section relates to all of child care, correct? And not just the regulated system. Correct. I'm going to scroll up. So we can look at the introductory language, but, but yes, this isn't, this oh, is, this, this is applicable to all, all childhood child care in the early edu in early education. It doesn't say anything in the introductory language that's specific to regulated care. So I'm wondering, Sarah, if that increases the concern or worry, or if that, um, in terms of it being a conflict with CCFAP or not? I would certainly defer to Melissa on the level of regulation. I think it's just that as, as we move forward with our year three plan for CCFAP, a family who has children under the age of five is going to have that family copay. So we've now gone from an individual copay yeah. to that to after schools being included to the extent that they're in the regulated. Mm -hmm. And this is now kind of asking us to pull a portion of that apart. Okay. I don't really see, I, you know, I have to say, I'm not really seeing that. I appreciate that. Um, but I'm going, um, I see Representative Wood and Representative Paella's hands are both up. So we'll start with Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I was just going to agree with what you just said. Um, because the way I, the way I'm reading section 12, the introductory language that um, Katie has up right now uh, references um, references the after school um, sort of portion and considerations that we talked about earlier today. And I look at that, and, and this is, I guess, a question for Katie. So I look at that introductory sentence as applying to everything that follows after that in section 12. Is that accurate, Katie? I think the intent was to set that up. Um, I'm trying to think it through because, you know, subsection A is sort of a, a standalone subsection. What do we have in B? The way I read it is A is setting a frame for the, what is in the entire study. Right, that, that's, that's the way I was reading it. And if, if that's accurate, then I feel like the concerns that um, the department is raising are covered, are addressed, I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you. Um, I would uh, just agree with that. You would agree, okay. With Madam, okay. Chair, Madam Chair and um, Representative. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Representative Payala. Um, uh, Melissa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Melissa Regal Garrett, Policy Director for the Child Development Division. Um, uh, am I understanding that you're saying your intent here is to examine financing of all child care, regulated and unregulated? I believe so. Um, so I'll just uh, 
offer? I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm saying that I want some, that is my understanding of this. And I'm going to, I, I'm going to punt initially to um, the bill primary sponsors and or let's grow kids. That's true. That is what's here. <laughs> yes. That, that, I was study. just going to concur okay. with Representative Brumstead. <laughs> I just, I don't want to send us down a different path. Okay. Um, I, I would offer that um, I believe in um, uh, Title 33, that there's some real specific language about uh, what constitutes uh, regulated and what uh, programs are potentially considered legally exempt from regulation. And then there's an entire world of programs um, that are essentially illegally operating in the state um, and that the committee may want to be um, specific about what um, they are trying to uh, cover when you, um, when you say all programs. Um, uh, if, we, if we were to use the word regulated, are pro programs have to be regulated, otherwise they're illegal? Uh, there are programs that are legally operating. Uh, they there are exemptions that are spelled out in Title 33. So for example, um, uh, a, a person could care for their own children and uh, the families of two additional children and not be regulated and they are considered legally operating um, uh, and exempt from our regulations. Um, but uh, once a person takes on a third family, uh, that is considered um, illegal operation. And there are other exemptions that exist uh, within that uh, category in Title 33. So is there a, 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 a Title 33 section blah, blah, I, talks about I can find you if, yeah, if you'd like. I mean, it, you know, this would include uh, nannies, you know, if nanny, if uh, the world of nannies uh, taking care of children in people's homes, if you leave it uh, broad and wide. So just ensuring that the committee is getting uh, to the, to what you are actually wanting to understand financing. Um, it, it was not my understanding that we were interested in nannies but I could be wrong. So I am again looking to the primary, uh, I was gonna say Representative Ken <laughs> Kenny, Sarah Kenny. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do, I appreciate the question. I do think it probably makes sense to reference regulated and I do think it makes sense to also include legally exempt because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa, but some of those legally exempt providers are eligible for CCFAP support for the kids at those programs? No, I do think it's a, I, I think it makes sense to include legally exempt because I think it's part of the bigger conversation around what the current costs in the system are and what they would be in the future. And it's, I think, especially important as some of the conversations in Vermont and nationally are thinking about culturally specific childcare and um, the, those kinds of conversations. I think that, that the legally exempt universe is a part of that conversation. So, um, and, and I'm, I do think that they, that those programs are specified in Title 33. So it does reference that. Yep. Oh, so, CCAP that does cover uh, approved relative child care, um, right. but that is Thank not um, that is not the world of legally exempt. Got it. Um, I I was hearing uh, Representative Rosenquist. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understood what. Uh, Sarah was saying that then it would cover just those regulated programs. That's what we're focusing on. Is that correct? Um, Sarah, I believe the question is, uh, to, or is the question to Sarah Kenny of Let's Grow Kids? Yes, correct. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I was suggesting that it be limited to regulated programs and legally exempt programs as well. Um, which is referenced in the Title 33 language that would provide further definition for the consultants working on this. So we need I don't, I don't know that it's 
I'm sorry, Representative Rosenquist. I was just gonna say, I don't know that it's possible to do an analysis of all of the, the illegally operating programs out there. I think that's I, I think that's what Melissa is getting at is that's a whole other right. universe or nannies or all the, I don't, I, that would probably be a several years project. Um, um, uh, M Melissa, in, in the Title 33 definite section that you're gonna show uh, or give Katie, um, family, um, family child care, are they, is that part and parcel of the regular? Yes. Okay, so Carl, the um, Representative Rosenquist, um, so family, um, not, not only child care centers, but family based providers, family um, are also included. Understood, as long as it's a regulated program. But Sarah's saying that to make them, uh, what, what do you call it? The, the two family exemption uh, would mm -hmm. also be included. Yes, that would be part and parcel of what is in the definition. I'm looking to now, Melissa, um, in the definition in Title 33, the legally exempt. Yeah, so Title 33, and I'm uh, frantically trying to find this section to, to get to Katie, um, but um, that spells out um, several options for legal exemption that includes a family that takes care of the children from two additional families but we don't regulate them. So our licensors do not go in uh, to um, uh, view and inspect their site. Um, and uh, they don't register with the state of Vermont in any way, shape or form. So our, for example, our data at the child development division, we don't necessarily have a list or even know what the scope of that uh, is or entails. So it, it does, add to the study in terms of being able to find them um, and understand uh, families' use of them. But um, just so you're aware that, that that's what we have for data. Representative McFawn. If I might ask one question, Madam Chair, how does somebody, how does an entity become legally exempt? Is there a process for that or how does it happen? Do, do I just say to myself, I'm legally exempt? Because I, see, I see Melissa shaking her head. Yes, I, I say, okay, I'm legally exempt. And right? so, and so and there's no way the consultant is gonna be able to be involved with them because they don't, we don't even know who they are. Nobody, who knows who they are? I don't even know why we're talking about them. So I am looking for um, some. I, can, I, I guess I would say that somewhat that's true, Representative McFawn, but somewhat most people do know by word of mouth what's available in their community. And if this were a, um, a study, I'm not, I'm actually not sure, but I would think that there's some ability to collect that data um, just by word of mouth, but um, maybe we don't want it. I, I don't know. I look to Let's Grow Kids on this one, actually. Um, um, Were you thinking that you um, wanted this data in the, maybe I'm not supposed to. <laughs> May I manage? Um, represent, um, sorry, um, uh, uh, Sarah Kenny, and then um, uh, the committee has, um, Representative McFawn has another question. So um, Sarah, Representative Brumstead has a question for you. Um, I would say I'm, I would, in some ways defer to Melissa and the folks at CDD about how much information is actually available about that universe of folks. I thought because they were defined in Title 33 that there was some data available about, but if there is not, then I mean, if there's no information available, then it probably doesn't make sense. Okay, so if there's no, if there's no information available, it probably doesn't make sense. 
Um, Melissa, what I'm hearing you say is there is no um, data available for that group. Is that correct? Okay. Um, uh, my my suggestion to the committee is that we not then include the legally exempt. I'm seeing some nods and I see Representative McFawn has his hand up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I would agree with you. And I would ask the committee, does anybody disagree with that? Please raise your hand if you disagree. Just trying to think it through. Uh because what you're doing is exempting these people from uh, participating in the scholarship program as well, presumably, because uh, uh, so they would not get any educational benefits or they right now can't qualify for the uh, CCFAP or whatever you call it, okay, is my understanding from, from Melissa. Uh, is that true? But they could qualify if we don't, if we, uh, how should I say it, if we include them, they would be eligible for some of the financial assistance for education. Um, Carl, I believe where we are right now um, is in terms of section 12 is the financing of the system and with the following goals and that the, oh, okay, never mind. I'm keeping my mouth shut. I, it's not just the fine, I mean, it's not just the financing. Um, it's also that child care providers receive compensation that's permissive. Um, Representative Brumstead has her hand up and Representative McFawn. And I believe, Representative Rosenquist, that if you are, unregulated and outside of the system, then you wouldn't have any of the rules around needing education to be able to take in maybe one or two families that you're helping out with. So the, that you wouldn't have that same impetus to need loan repayment and scholarship funds. And so it might be okay to leave them out, I guess is what I'm saying. Or it might function as, and it might function as a um, impetus yeah. for people to um, come in, to come in. Um, Representative McFawn and then Representative Wood. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm agreeing with uh, Representative Brumstead as well. Um, if, we, if we don't have information on them, we, and, I, and, and the, the example I used is I could declare myself legally exempt. Um, to me, Let's deal with the people that we can regulate and we, can, we have the information on. We can, uh, we're already working with them uh, based on the governor's five-year plan. Um, I, I, I just think we need to, um, I, I'm okay with the age, you know, up to uh, 12. But when we start talking about people like me that can open up the back of my house and say, I'm legally uh, exempt, there's no way the consultant is gonna be able to find those people and do a good job of it. Um, we've, got, we've got him working with Kelly's group um, <laughs> or her working with Kelly's group. So that, that seems to me uh, fine. We can, we can give scholarships to them. Uh, we can do loan repayments. We're building the system that we, we can, we regulate and we can, control a little bit. Um, I, I think when we, if we get off in the, in, in the swamp or the weeds with these other places, there's no end to it. And okay. e even if we find out the information, there's no okay. way we can say to them, you have to do this. Yeah, I think Tapper, uh, Representative McFawn, that's a great point. Um, thank you. Uh, Representative Wood. Um, I just wanted to um, point out to Representative Rosenquist that our scholarship programs in chapter, uh, subchapter five um, are related to people who uh, work or will commit to working in a regulated childcare setting. So um, I just point. wanted to 
I, yeah. I acknowledge that I, I, I agree with you at this point. And Topper was very uh, persuasive. Okay, and I, I do want to point out, Representative Rosenquist, that in in uh, the scholarships for prospective early childhood providers could be open to people who are currently non you know working in a non regulated system. Um, but they would commit to working in a regulated childcare at at the completion of their coursework. So that actually is open to people who do not currently work in um, in regulated childcare. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, are there other additions, suggestions for the financing um, study? Representative Brumstead and Representative McFawn. Okay, so we still haven't really resolved the issues on um, page 20, well, my page 20, line 12, the whether or not we include or get rid of for children from birth under five years of age, which is somewhat repetitious of the beginning. And then also um, on line 14 on page 18, same thing. So I agree with Kelly. I think that there's a lot of work being done in that other. Um, okay, um, um, Jessica, I apologize. I think we passed that. Oh, I we, thought that we- We, had... we passed that. Thank okay. you, we passed that. So we decided- um, Sarah, to... we, 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 yes, uh, Sarah okay. Kenny and then Representative McFawn. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to say I had submitted language earlier with proposed changes and then had a conversation with um, Nolan from JFO over the lunch hour and have some updated language to propose. Um, generally, I defer to JFO on these matters though, since they're gonna be running the study. So we had talked about um, potentially including some May language just so that there's language in the bill that discusses some of the national entities and the folks in Vermont working specific to the question about compensation commensurate with peers in other fields and the cost of care modeling. Um, PCF and others had raised questions about what exactly that meant. So we wanted to just provide some potential language to help flesh that out a little bit, which I'm happy to walk through with folks whenever, okay. that, whenever that makes sense. Oh, that probably makes sense um, right now. But before you do that, Representative Rosenquist has um, his hand up. Thank you. It was just, related to this section, because one of the portions here is that the goal would be to presumably uh, provide for people uh, so they would not have to spend more than 10% of their salary or their gross income. So I was wondering, does that limit us? Let's say the study shows that it's just economically unfeasible to go for 10% and maybe a higher percent is is more workable, you know, like 20% or something like that. Anyway, I, I just wouldn't want to limit us on that because the study is going to show us how much the total dollars are and, and whether it's practical to think we could raise that much money mm -hmm. and uh, that we wouldn't want to just possibly scrap the whole concept right. because of that 10%. Um, Representative Rosenquist, I think you, you raise a very important um, Point, and I think that is where um, we have tried to make some of the changes, which is that there needs to be a financial analysis. And my, I, I'll look to the financial people and um, Dr. Crossman, but my, my, my assumption and what I know is that the, they'll do an analysis and they may come back and go, you know, if you do it this way, it'll only cost, you know, it will only be 5% of a person's income. But if you do it this way, it could be 10. But if you do it this way, you know, you can't do it, you know, um, no one will have any money for anything else or the economy, whatever. But if you do it this way, we propose this way and it would be 20. So I, I do not think that, I guess the long and short of it is I don't think this limits it. It says what our goal is, um, um, and we we got information um, from 
we, we got data from um, CDD that in fact, in terms of where it's coming close to that already in terms of the five-year plan for CDD and so for, for that. So, um, but I, it does not limit it. And I wanna, I'm looking to um, the PhD scholars and the finance people to make sure that I'm not misspeaking. Oh, Carl, you're agreeing with me and you're, and you're, uh, and you're muted. <laughs> you're still muted. My, my space bar <laughs> has been doing that temporary thing now. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, I that's okay. Click on it. So, but I, I understand. I just wanted to make the point that I didn't want to lock us in on that percentage necessarily, but okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Representative Rosenwood. Um, Sarah. Thank you. I wonder, does it make sense for me to share my screen and am I able to do that? Um, I, I believe you're able to do that if um, Julie makes you a co-host. I'm sorry, who said that? Um, that, that is, um, Sarah Kenny. All right, one moment. You should be able to now, Sarah. Thank you, Julie. So can folks see that? Yeah. So this, just looking at this highlighted language here, we're recommending that we insert some language um, specific to the compensation commensurate with uh, peers and other fields language that just says the consultant may consult with the National Association for the Education of Young Children, the Vermont Advancing as a Recognized Profession Task Force and the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment for determining models for this and just a guidepost that public school salaries may serve as a relevant benchmark for comparable compensation, assuming comparable qualifications, experience, and job responsibilities. And this is a, a nod to some of the conversations that are happening both in Vermont and nationally around these questions of cost of care and what does comparable comp uh, commensurate compensation look like. So this, again, I offer as a very friendly amendment, we are not wedded to it. And um, I just wanted to put it out there for the committee's consideration. Okay, um, a committee is your preference that um, I get comments from Sarah Truckle and joint fiscal first, or do you want to weigh in first? I would like to get the, uh, the other people's um, information first. Okay, Tapper, you're the only one, uh, Representative McFawn, you're the only one who spoke. So uh, we're gonna follow you. Um, and um, uh, Nolan or um, Joyce? Sure, I can, I can comment on it. Um, yeah, I think um, we had seen some language uh, prior to this that had a lot of shalls. I think that May, is fine. Um, it doesn't tie. It doesn't tie the consultant to having to do it, but it also sort of flags for the consultant of the, about these national organizations um, that they may not have been aware of. And I think that you know our consultant is going to try to reach out to as many people as possible, regardless. So, um, and then the public school salaries. That was a, what we came up with. Is sort of like trying to find that. that you know, what would, might might be a good benchmark, and this sort of just again flags for the consultant that look at uh, teachers or public school salaries. So I think the May language is fine; it doesn't tie our hands. Thank you, Sarah Truckle. We we too are are in agreement with the May language and emphasize that you know from our standpoint we agree with JFO around not being prescriptive and providing that deference to the consultant and um, whatnot. So this seems to allow for that and um, makes sense. 
Okay, I, I want that to go into the column of we 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 retook your feedback. Um, Representative Wood. Um, I, I think that this does a good job of trying to um, thread that needle of providing some um, some information for the uh, potential consultant without um, legislating what that is, what exactly that it is. So um, previously, people were looking from some for some more guidance around what is uh, commensurate um, salaries with other peers, and this seems to do it from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Brumstead, because this was something that you brought up earlier today. I agree. I, I agree with Representative Wood and with um, number three here. I um, had looked at or heard about this actually, and um, it makes sense. It's It doesn't seem too prescriptive and um, I agree with Nolan. Okay. Um, Topper, your question. <laughs> um, but Topper, I can't hear you. Uh, Representative McFawn, I apologize. I still can't hear That's you. That's okay. That's okay, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would just ask a, the normal question. Is there anybody on the committee that would not want this in the draft? All right, that sounds good. Okay, um, thank you. Um, um, Adi, do you have what you need to put that section in? Um, I just uh, asked Sarah for a Word document so I could drop that language in, but. Once I have that, yes. Okay. Um, Katie, have we gone through section 12? We've gone through all the changes, yes. And so, so we were talking about um, in section 12, A is, is, a is the broad. A sets the, the, the framework sort of as a broader piece. And um, that um, when we're talking then about the goals, we're beginning to get narrower. And so we're keeping four children birth through five on um, A1. I'm sort of saying this and waiting for people to um, and uh, I don't know that we, did we follow, are we keeping the yellow? Um, I, I did not hear, and I came in late, that we were making any changes to um, um, the taking into consideration. Um, you know, this, the sources of information. And uh, then um, that identifying the feasibility of implementing a stable long-term funding sources to finance an affordable high. And then this was where you're gonna put in um, Katie language, right? Ident to whatever it is, the, the title, title 33. Yes, okay. would you like to see that? Yeah. Okay. So this is the language in green. Okay, so maybe, you know, maybe Katie, it would be helpful. I'm going through this, but if we all sort of look at what it is now, um, Representative McFawn has his hand up. I can't hear you. I, I th I'm trying to read this. As long as it gets into um, six through um, through twelve years old, that was my point. As you were flying through there, okay. You, so you so were we five years of age, and 
if it's if we're talking about the long-term funding taking it into consideration um, from children six years zero to twelve. That's what we're saying here, right? Uh, that's that's in the broad piece. Yes, that is what we're well, saying. Well, no, right I'm here. not talking right on or before September 21st in A. Yes, yes. What she's in got a. up here. Yes, that. Oh. In this subsection A, we're laying out the framework for the entire section, and we're saying that our focus on the financing study is birth through age five, but we're have added language that's highlighted in yellow saying that we're also giving consideration to the fact that the system for children six through 12 years of age intersects with the zero through five and also impacts any changes on the zero through five system impacts um, six through 12. And we're directing the consultant to take that fact into account and also the recommendations of the after school task force. Right. Okay. And that, that avoids the duplication. Correct. Correct? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I just got to check with all of you um, and with Katie, <laughs> definitely. Um, Katie, can you keep going? Sure. Um, this is the new language you just dropped in about the consultant. This is B3 that Sarah just reviewed. And then, um, I had a question about whether you wanted this Universal After School Task Force to remain in. Um, at worst, I think it's duplicative, but um, I, I don't otherwise see a reason why it should be omitted. Um, so that was a question for the committee, but I don't see a problem with leaving it in if you would like it there and to be clear. Yeah. Um, and then the, the last piece, um, was on this subdivision two, what is going to be part of the consultant's analysis. And we had the question of whether we should continue to specify um, with regard to um, financing um, or funding sources, um, children birth through age five years of age. And I believe the decision was that should remain in. So that's still there. And that was it for this section. Um. Thank you, Katie. Could you stop sharing your screen? And um, before, um, Amy Schulenberger, do you have any issues with what is going on? No, Madam Chair, I think it looks good from our perspective and I'd like to thank the committee for your work. Um, thank you. Um, Sarah Truckle, have we heard all your concerns? We may not have addressed all of them, but have we heard your concerns? Yep, I think we are also, we've, we've raised our concerns and I, I believe you've actually addressed them as well. Okay, unbelievable. Sorry, um, just teasing. Um, Any by um, Morgan or um, Sarah or, um, Melissa. Melissa. Okay. Um, Representative McFawn, your question. Does anybody? I'm, well, I gotta get unmuted before I can do it. Is there anybody on the committee that at this juncture is not satisfied with what we have in this draft in its entirety. Ooh. Oh, wait a minute. We, are the dates at the end okay? The implementation dates, I... Um, I, um, I don't know, um, but I'm getting a yes from Representative Rumstead. Um, uh, but go ahead. I um. I did look at those because just so the committee knows, I've worked on an updated timeline. And so once we get through hearing from Nolan and all that, I'm happy to pass that along. But we we have a timeline now that is about as complicated as it gets. <laughs> um, and Topper, really the question that we're at, although I wish we were, is for this section, not for the oh, whole bill. Yeah. This was the, this was the uh, second to last section. Yeah. Uh, okay, are we all uh, in agreement with this section? 
anybody that's not in agreement. Okay. I see none. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sarah Truckle, I want to give you an opportunity to, um, as you have reviewed, um, we've gone through various sections um, and what are, you, you walked away and you said, okay, I will, I will come back with our views. So we've addressed uh, the components that we had had in section five, as well as in section 12. Uh, the only two other sections that we had flagged during the um, break for review is one is in section three, which I know we've kind of consistently said just creates that uh, unfunded budget pressure. We would continue to stress that that is going to be a uh, future unfunded budget pressure and that it could have a policy implication should it not be funded in subsequent years resulting in CCFAP moving to a wait list, which would mean that families um, could effectively receive no assistance instead of receiving kind of that lesser uh, okay. payment. So, so for us, that's a continued concern. Okay, and section three, and we'll get more of that from Nolan, section three relates to um, uh, reimbursing um, in terms of the most current uh, Vermont child care rate survey, um, et cetera. Correct, and we are moving to the most current market rate survey in the governor's 2022 right. budget. So it's just the, the fact that it creates that obligation for future years. Um, and then the only other section that we flagged was section nine. I'm not sure if it's helpful for us to identify some thoughts there. I'm fine with section nine. Um, oh, section nine has to do with the building bright futures, right? What, what yes. section? The advisory like, committee. Yep. Um, please um, share what your concerns are. So as we've, we've talked about before, BBF is already established as the state advisory committee through Act 104. So we wondered if creating some um, language around that in effect that their Act 104 already creates um, this the, them as the state advisory council and that um, they already have established committees under that, including the ELD committee that's named here, but also other committees that address uh, some of these same points um, and wonder around if there's a way to, rather than having all of those listed points, just simply say uh, that in accordance with Act 104, BBF is the state advisory council and advises the department on services pertaining to childcare and early education, rather than being as prescriptive because that is already their role um, as defined. And then the only other suggestion that we would provide um, is that the membership uh, is limiting it to the ELD committee, but as I know Dr. Crossman has talked about, there are multiple committees that take up these issues. So rather than naming ELD, uh, could we just say Building Bright Futures committees? And then uh, we did wonder with those 21 named uh, participants, if that's always gonna, if, if the goal is engagement, do we wanna add in some language around whenever that's feasible, given that, um, parents might choose to provide input via a survey or might not be able to always attend a committee meeting. Um, so if the goal is really engagement, um, obviously Dr. Crossman has a lot of different representatives on that committee and works with many different people, um, but, but wouldn't wanna prolong or um, not be able to move forward with work if not everybody could be at every meeting. So just those were some of our suggestions. And that's it. Thank you. Um, Representative McFawn. Um, did, Madam Chair, I, I thought that um, Dr. Crossman said that if somebody didn't show up, if they couldn't show up, that was okay, that they could get the information other ways. Um, uh, she did. Um, um, she did say that and she talked about um, 
that was that was the addition of the word engagement, um, I believe, um, to, uh, to to put into play um, that there are different ways of people participating. Right. Um, well, uh, uh, let me look around here. Is Dr. Grossman on? Yes, Dr. Grossman is on. Uh, I might ask her without putting her on the spot. I, uh, if she can answer the question, I would appreciate it. Oh, um, the answer... Is she, is she okay with what we've got written? Dr. Crossman, are you okay with what is currently in the draft? For the record, Morgan Crossman, Executive Director of Building Bright Futures. Um, you know, I, I agree that what's written in the draft does reflect what we are able to do if it's required as part of the bill. But I also want to remind the committee that what the state has outlined as our role in statute and the existing committee infrastructure is in place, right? So we do have the Early Learning Development Committee alongside six other VCAP committees. So I, you know, I appreciate the um, the inclusion of the word engage because it does allow more flexibility in the fact that at one committee table, it will be challenging to have 21 plus people in addition to the existing committee infrastructure that's there attend every single meeting. And we absolutely do want to have the flexibility to be able to engage other committees like the Family Engagement Committee, the Professional Preparation and Development Committee in a lot of these tasks. Um, this bill does very clearly prescribe the work of those committees that has not been the standard practice for what we do currently at BBF. We have a very broad charge um, for all of our different committee work. So this bill is absolutely being more prescriptive in uh, who is at the table, how often they are at that table and uh, the types of discussions that we would be having at those tables. Um, so just wanting to be very clear with the committee that this would be a change to how we run existing committees. Um, Thank happy you. Happy to answer questions. Um, Representative Whitman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my follow-up question would be, um, it's stated in the bill that um, a quorum of the committee is a majority of the members. Um, do you foresee any issue with having a simple majority of membership present? It's a great question. And, and if the required membership of one through 21 in the list were not at that table, I could absolutely see that being an issue for having to call a vote, for example, on certain components of this bill. The way these uh, committees are currently run is by both a public and private co-chair that come together. They do have discussions and do come to consensus on making recommendations as a, as a body. But I think to, um, to the state and our administration's point, there are several committees that do take up different components of what are required in this bill. So for example, if we are talking about, um, you know, broadly the administration of childcare and early education, we do have multiple committees that are working on that same topic in different ways, different smaller ways over time. So um, I, I think coming to a quorum would be really challenging depending on which topic because not all committees are meeting in the same place at the same time. Uh, our network is over 450 people every single month. Um, so just, just wanting the committee to be very mindful of what that looks like, which is why we do really need that flexibility and being able to, um, to have different ways of engaging all of these different stakeholders, whether or not it's in the same exact meeting time. And so you don't feel that this language as is gives you the flexibility? Uh, correct. I would say that removing language around a quorum would be helpful there. Um, I, again, you know, we do have this existing infrastructure. What this bill is doing is very clearly prescribing the topics, the timelines, they are, it's requiring reports, all of which is feasible. But the membership around a specific committee um, 
we, you know, we can add all of those different individuals to the existing early learning and development committee and consult with all of these other different committees through both meeting times, surveys, um, you know, focus group type sessions to come to recommendations that are eventually voted on by the state advisory council um, and, and supported by these smaller groups. But I would say that removing language around a quorum is important. Thank you. Um, Uh-oh. Um, Representative Wood, you get to talk and then we're going to have to change subjects because we're going to lose our joint fiscal person. Um, I'll, I'll pass, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, we're gonna have to get, um, get, get back to this um, and I'm gonna turn it over. So um, Representative Rosenquist, we're going to get back to this discussion because right now um, we have limited time with, our, um, with the fiscal note. Um, so, uh, Nolan, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, uh, I actually am glad that we didn't do it this morning because I was able to link it up to uh, draft 5.3, so it matches Katie's uh, most recent draft. Um, and because and because we've um, walked through everything section by section, I don't think I need to rehash everything. So I'm going to focus on a summary, but. I'm going to pull up the screen, and this should be on the website. It is. Uh, okay. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me blow that up a little. Um, so I'm just going to focus on page uh, four um, because we've already walked through all the sections. I flagged some of the things that Sarah Truckle discussed about um potential uh fiscal pressures and out years on, regarding section three and then so if we just focus on the summary i don't know that everyone has a chance to actually look at all the numbers combined so this breaks it out by the sections so you can see section two three and four we've got the 5.529 million i put a flag by it because that's um as you all know it's already included in the governor's recommended budget same with section five, which is the BFIS system, the 4.5 million, that's also in the governor's budget. Then um, six, seven, and oh, what one, um, and the 5.5, just to be clear, in, encompasses both the, the CCFAP language and the provider payment section. So it's both of those combined, so they're inter intertwined. Um, six, seven, and eight, that's our scholarships um, for early childhood for prospective early childhood providers and the student loans. So you can see I've broken out the 300, the 400 and the 1.8 million. Um, and then section nine, um, this is the part, this is the committee work. There was 25 in the bill, it's combined now. Earlier language I think was appropriating directly to for building bright futures. And we don't actually generally appropriate directly to contractors, we appropriate to agencies and departments who then contract with contractors. So in the last, it just says $33,000 to, um, um, to DCF, but it's supposed it's specifics for 25,000 for the building by bright futures or um, advising the committee. And then the other 8,000 would be for per diems for the new committee members. Because um, currently the committee members, my understanding is they're not eligible, the public members are not eligible for per diem reimbursements so this as language that would make them eligible for per diem and reimbursement. And we estimate that to be about $8,000. Um, then we have the Building Bright Future System Analysis Study that's 200,000. And then the financing study, we have 500,000 appropriate. So all these dollar amounts are specifically, already specifically appropriate in the bill for a total of $13.262 million. And then the last thing I just, I. You know, we always had, we we put a little note in here, just a, a reminder that you know the federal bill is going to be passing soon, um, and that that would be at the most recent version um, we can see as much as eighty million dollars for child care through, through for the child care stuff through tax credits and other assistance, um, and so that there could be some potential overlap there. So that's good news. Um, Thank you, um, Nolan. I'm going to interrupt you because. Um, Morgan Crossman has her hand up, and so I'm presuming it has something to do with what you have just reported. And 
So I wanted to give her the chance to ask the question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, to let folks know that there is already a mechanism by which Building Bright Future State Advisory Council receives funding routed through the Child Development Division, specifically through uh, the Office of the Head Start Collaboration Office Director. So there would be an opportunity to just adjust that scope of work to, to route funding through that mechanism. Thank you. And um, Representative Brumstead, do you have a question for um, Nolan about the fiscal note? Yes, just a quick one. Um, he put little stars next to the areas that are in the governor's budget, and there's also 150,000 of the loan repayment for current providers in as well. So I just wanted to make that note. I know it's only a small amount, but every dollar helps. Well, I mean, I, it's not really, we're not really passing a bill with 13 million. It's only <laughs> three. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Representative um, Wood and um, uh, actually Representative Wood perhaps will let Sarah truckle and then we'll have Representative Wood. Um, uh, Dr. Crossman, are is your hand still up because you have another comment? Okay, and Representative Brumstead, is your hand up because you have a comment? No. Okay, so um, Sarah truckle and then Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to front. We do have the money that you're speaking of, Representative Brumstead, in our base, but this is an addition to the base appropriation. So this is new money that is being identified here. It, it wouldn't, um, it would be an addition to the current and existing budget, at, at least in my understanding of, oh, I'm seeing nodding heads, so. Representative Wood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to make that one point uh, that Sarah Truckle just made as well. But I am also wondering if it is possible, um, Nolan, for um, uh, this to be um, for the, the dollar columns to have um, a column for uh, in the governor's existing budget, a uh, column for what's in the bill that's not in the budget, and then the total. Um, because I, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm just trying to anticipate, you know, on the floor when people, they always look to the bottom line and that's what they're assuming is the quote unquote new investment and it, it is not. Um, and I've already had conversations with people in appropriations that that's what their impression is. So um, I, I think it would be clearer if we could adjust that, how that's presented, but thank you very much for your work on this. I, I am happy to add that and make that adjustment when I update this for as recommended by the committee. So when it goes to appropriations, I'll have that column. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not quite sure when it goes. This is, I'm not quite sure the path this bill is <laughs> taking. Um, Representative Rosenquist. Thank you. Just following up on Representative Wood's comments, uh, just wanted to ask uh, Nolan if the federal money could cover portions of, of the portion that's not in the governor's budget, such as the IT cost and the, uh, the study itself, the $500,000 for the financial study. It's a great question and the answer is I don't know. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the federal budget and what the specific language is of what the money can and cannot be used for. Um, I think there could potentially be opportunities there, but I would defer to uh, DCF or other folks who are more familiar with what is going to be coming through than I am. Thank you. And you don't want me to talk because I will say, even if the money has to be directed towards one place, then money that would have gone there, you know, you can do, you move money around as it is appropriate. And as it, so it could only be a help, um, Representative Rosenquist, although it might not be directed exactly at this, it could be directed somewhere else. And so that money could be put into some of this. Um, Representative Wood. Um, Madam Chair, I just, um, 
wanted to, I, I, I know that we're just dealing with the last section, but section two, I don't think is, is quite accurate at the beginning. Um, uh, it, 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 or at least the way I'm reading it, um, it makes it sound that we are uh, expanding from a zero copay from 100 to 150%. And we are expanding from 100 to 150%. However, um, currently there is a copay. Um, so um, maybe I'm the only one who, who is reading it this way. There is a copay at the bottom end of the, of the fee scale right now. Um, so you are looking um, at page two of the bill. Um, uh, I, no, I'm just, I'm looking at um, section oh. two of Nolan's oh. um, fiscal note. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, Nolan, could you put your fiscal note back up so that we all can see it since I went yeah. to the bill? So I'm just, I'm asking maybe um, uh, for um, Melissa or Sarah Truckle to just carefully review that language to ensure its accuracy. I was reading it one way and perhaps I'm just overthinking it. If, if it's mischaracterized in any way, I'm happy to change it. I was just trying to outline, um, describe what I thought was. Right, no no criticism implied. I, oh, yeah. This is a group, um, a group effort. I don't know, Sarah Truckle if you, um, or Melissa, if you can read this section right now, if you see it on your computer. I think uh, it's consistent moving to that 150% of the FPL at the base. And we both, I'm just, Melissa's just texting me, she agrees. So we, we don't see this as being any concern. Okay, thank you. I thought I might be over, over reading it, but thank you, appreciate it, thank you. Um, do we have other questions for, um, Nolan, as it relates to the um, fiscal note. Okay, um, going back to, um, thank you, Nolan, very much. Um, thank you for your work over the weekend and over the week. And um, it's really very much appreciative because I know we kept changing things. So thank you uh, very much. Um, Okay, I stopped a conversation in the middle. Um, Representative Wood and then Representative um, Rosenquist. So who did you want to go? Uh, I think I, um, Representative Wood, unless she doesn't want to speak. Both of you had um, your hands up and Representative Wood said, okay. Well, I'll, right. I'll, I'll go ahead momentarily then, I guess. Okay, okay. you go ahead. Unless, unless she wants to butt in. But uh, I, I was just curious, uh, uh, Ms. Truckle had uh, suggested uh, the, how should I say it, that committee, that the committee be replaced with what already exists with Building Bright Futures. And I was curious how the chair of Building Bright Futures uh, feels about that. Um, okay. I mean, I think she was trying to say some of what she was um, doing that, but um, uh, Dr. Crossman. Sure. Thank you for that question. And thank you for coming back to this. It, it is a really complicated topic, right? So for the committee, again, we have seven Vermont Early Childhood Action Plan committees that address a range of topics to support moving forward Vermont's early childhood strategic plan. Three of those committees are really integral to talking about childcare. The primary one being early learning and development, which is named in this bill or is potentially named in this bill as the, the body that would serve in this advisory role. In addition to that committee, the Professional Preparation and Development Committee and the Families and Communities Committee would be important to engage in these different conversations. So um, in the membership, 
of this one committee that's being defined, it is challenging to say, for example, that we would be calling for a quorum on a specific vote because there are other committees that we'd wanna engage in that discussion as we're making those recommendations. So we do have existing infrastructure to ask those questions and host those discussions in different ways. Um, specifically through committee meetings, but also through um, holding focus groups, holding um, surveys and information gathering efforts. So what I was trying to articulate is that um, we would want the flexibility in this membership and in this bill to be able to make sure that we are engaging all of those groups. So I mean, I guess, you know, I appreciate that explanation, but it still uh, doesn't specifically address the fact, would you embrace the change suggested by Ms. Tur Turkle that uh, your committee, as it currently exists, can do the job that we're, we've put and tasked this additional committee to? So it's a challenging answer. And the answer as it stands is no, because what we don't have is this prescriptive nature in our existing committees. What this bill asks for is very clear questions around childcare, one through, you know, lines 14 through, uh, through one on pages 11 to 12. And that is very clearly asking the committee infrastructure to monitor specific components and bringing together very concrete membership associated with making those decisions. Um, so the way that our committees are currently operating do address a lot of these issues, not all in one place, not within one committee across multiple. So what this bill is asking for is an additional scope of work. It's asking for two and a half reports to the legislature uh, that we do not currently do. So it is an additional scope of work. Um, what I'm saying is if the committee is set on prescribing this scope of work, Building Bright Futures can execute it by adjusting membership. Um, and if the committee is not set to prescribing the scope of work, we could use our existing network and build the membership around it. Um, but we do not have the capacity as it stands right now to, to without additional funding, all of a sudden do additional work with you know two reports per year and that type of thing. So it really is committee's decision about the prescriptive nature of this section of the bill. Um, but either way, Building Bright Futures can execute this role. It's just a question of how you want to move this forward and whether or not there's funding associated. I thought we had, were in this bill, there was $200,000 extra to Building Bright Futures to do some of this work. So uh, you're saying you would need additional money beyond no. that to do this? No. So there are two sections in this bill that Building Bright Futures is named. Section nine is hosting this advisory body. There's $25,000 a year for the two years that that advisory body would be in existence dedicated to Building Bright Futures to address the descriptive scope of work that's in here, to include additional committee members, host additional meetings, and provide two reports to the legislature and to the administration in that advisory role. Separate from that advisory body, there's also a governance or now a systems analysis study that Building Bright Futures is tasked with executing. And that scope of work in and of itself is $200,000 that would be allocated to Building Bright Futures. So, so um, Dr. Grossman, the question being, there's $200,000 in the bill to do the work. I believe Representative Rosenquist's question was, do you need money in addition to that? And I'm hearing you say no. I apologize if I'm not being clear, but- No, I'm, I'm, I'm because you're talking, I'm getting it into question and quick and, and short answer so that we can understand it. So $200,000 we need to do section 10, which is right. the study. And is, section nine, as it's currently written, BBF needs $25,000 a year, which and, is- And bill. both of those are in the bill right now. Correct. Okay, so no additional money outside of what is in the bill. Correct. Um, and what I also heard you 
um, say, Dr. Crossman, is that it was your and um, the use of the word engage was to provide some flexibility in the way people were engaged and that maybe it would work better. You might, you might suggest taking out the word quorum in terms of things, um, that that might give you uh, the flexibility in terms of the way you engage people. Uh, Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I'm going to acknowledge, first off, that I'm getting frustrated by this conversation. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it, it feels like we keep, um, uh, it feels like, you know, frankly, one thing's being said and then something's being backtracked and now we're, you know, trying to go down a different path here. And I feel like um, we have, uh, with all due respect to the department, um, the, this is a child care bill and we have very specific things that we want to see from this committee about child care. Um, and I, granted, I understand that current statute that establishes BBF is broad and provides you know, a broad array of things as Dr. Crossman has said. Um, I believe that we should keep in the specificity of what it is that we are looking for because if we don't, um, we don't really know what we're gonna get, frankly. Um, and um, it, with, re with regard to um, the specificity with regard to the, the composition, um, it, we have heard previous testimony from Dr. Crossman that uh, essentially most of these things are already met and that that um, committee could be adjusted to include the additional members as necessary. Um, I, I think that what is intended here is that the recommendations would be coming forth from this committee, um, not necessarily the committee that sits above this, um, uh, because this is the committee that has the broad representation, including businesses um, on it that uh, may or may not exist on the on the other committee. Um, so, you know, with all due respect to the input that we've been receiving in the last 45 minutes. I, I think that the language here is language that we have previously agreed to. Thank uh, you. I was just trying to follow up on what the suggestion was from Ms. Turkle. So I take it that the rest of the committee doesn't, uh, doesn't want to pursue that further. Is that correct? Um, I, I'm just Ms. Voice, uh, Representative Rosenquist, I was just voicing my um, personal um, thoughts about it. Um, so I don't know what the other committee members feel. And um, Rep uh, Representative Rosenquist, I don't either, but I do see that Representative Small has her hand up, as does um, Representative Redman. Representative hey. Small. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would motion that we remove the word quorum, and that is about it from this section in relation to understanding that BBF is doing a wonderful job in getting folks to the table. And uh, if quorum is what would set them back on this process, then I think uh, that's the one word I would recommend to remove. OK, thank you. Um, that is uh, Katie um, number, um, um, at least on an old version, Page 14, number three. A majority of the membership shall cons constitute a quorum. Maybe the majority of attendees or something. Um, we can get back to that. Representative, um, cause sorry, because clearly Representative Small and I are of the same opinion. I don't know if the rest of the committee is. Um, Representative Redman. Yeah, I have very little to add other than I completely agree with Representative Wood, uh, her point that she made, and I'm eager to move forward. So just wanted to confirm that. Um, we'll, we'll start with the broad question. Are we ready um, to broadly move um, uh, complete this discussion of this section and move forward. Are we making the change that Representative Small made? Um, are we making the change um, that Representative um, Small suggests? Um, 
we have thumbs up from Representative Rosenquist and Representative Small and everybody uh, at Representative McFawn, of course, too. Um, Katie, do you see where we are? Yes, I've changed a membership to attendees. A majority of the attendees shall constitute a quorum. Okay. Um, committee, are you, um, where are we in this process? Um, are you, do you, how much more, um, what, how, what else do you need to go through? Representative McFawn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, last time we got to this point, um, I asked the question about the effective dates. Are they okay? Um, good question, Representative McFawn. I believe that Representative Brumstead said she had looked at them and they were okay, but let me um, uh, look to um, Sarah Truckle, who has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Sarah Truckle has disappeared. So I can't, um, uh, but Melissa is here. Oh, and so is Miranda. Okay, so we're <laughs> Oh, the deputy commissioner, um, deputy commissioner um, uh, Gray is here. Yes. I'm sorry, um, Sarah had to leave and Melissa is now um, actually en route um, somewhere. So we'll have a hard time answering questions timely. If you restate the question for me one more time, I can do my best or I will get back to you. No, that's, um, I think the question um, uh, was the last section has to do with um, implementation dates. And um, I believe that, that they are fine, but um, uh, the question was asked. Yes, we don't have any concerns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then Madam Chair, yes, maybe it's time to ask the committee. Um, we've gone through 13 sections. Um, is anybody, does anybody on the committee feel that we have not exhausted all of the information um, that we could and we have uh, put it together into a bill and uh, Katie is gonna final draft everything and um, we make a decision. Are we okay with the bill to go forward now? Um, Representative McFawn, if I can um, summarize the the import is that um, are we ready to um, perhaps ask Katie if she needs anything from us, um, and then are we ready to move forward and that's, make a decision? That's fine with me. Okay. Um, Representative Whitman, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I hate to do this, uh, hope it's simple, but the last change that we recommended changing members to attendees for a quorum, I'm not really sure how that would be interpreted for attendees, a majority of attendees. What would that mean? I'm wondering if we just strike the whole line. Well, you can say those that are attending. No, I, I, the well, I, I think what um, that, I mean, that is what we have said. I think the question, Representative McFawn, is what what does that mean? Well, um, how how will that impact the product or the work of the committees? And um, I would, uh, Representative Wood. Madam Chair, I, I think that uh, perhaps we are being a bit too prescriptive in this section. I would agree with Representative Whitman. Committees usually decide among themselves um, how they will constitute, um, you know, who is chairing the committee and what constitutes a quorum. Um, 
Um, um, Representative McFawn or Representative Gregoire, could you put yourself on mute because we're double hearing. Um, did it, um, I am on mute. That's okay. Um, uh, Representative Wood is agreeing with Representative um, um, Whitman that we uh, just delete that sentence at this point. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, Representative Wood, do you still have your hand up to add something? No. Um, I, I'm going to ask um, the Representative McFawn question. Um, uh, before we do that, oh, Katie, okay. Katie, are we okay with that? It's fine if you remove it. I think it's a policy question, whether you want the General okay, Assembly cool, to decide cool. or the committee to decide. Good, that takes care of that. So my next question is, is there anything else that the committee needs to move this bill forward? So we don't need anything else, Madam Chair. I think we're ready to move the bill forward. Nice job, everybody. And all our helpers too. Um, I would um, entertain a motion on um, draft six. Katie? Is it draft six? It'll be 6.1, yep. Draft 6.1 and I see Representative Brumstead. I'd like to make a motion to that the committee approve section, I mean, uh, the child care bill uh, section 6.1 or, or what is Version. it, draft 6.1, sorry. Okay, there's been, there's been a motion by Representative um, Rumstead that the committee accept um, um, or approve uh, draft 6.1 of um, H171. Do I have a second? I already did it. Okay. Rep and the, there's been a second by Representative McFawn. Um, is there um, any discussion? As the person who made the motion, can I just say thank you as well? This is really the first really hard bill that we have done virtually that was complicated and we somehow worked with all folks inside and outside the committee and really unbelievable. So I just thank you. Thank you. And um, I am sorry that uh, Sarah Truckle is not here because she very good naturedly um, participated very fully in this. Um, and uh, I appreciate her acknowledgement that, that we came quite forward. <laughs> we didn't necessarily um, come all that we came quite forward and um, uh, appreciate um, each and every member of the committee, but more importantly, and you know, of the, whether it is Let's Grow Kids, whether it is um, Building Bright Futures, whether um, it is um, DCF, and, um, DCF um, the after school program and um, the Childhood Alliance, I'm sorry, Matt's group, I don't know what it is. Um, and- Reba. Um, and Reva and Katie um, and Legislative Council who worked all the time. But more importantly, I think that this, um, uh, this bill represents um, a step forward. Um, we have um, set a goal and in the, um, for the future in terms of making childcare more um, affordable um, quality childcare and at the same time um, taken some very concrete steps for the immediacy in terms of the workforce, in terms of providing, um, you know, educational opportunity um, for doing that. And we all know that this is very important in terms of um, ensuring that um, the Vermont's recovery um, works for everyone and that in fact, people can get back to work 
and that families um, have the resources that they need and children can grow. So I think it took us a long time. I felt badly from time to time. I want to say, especially for the new members, when you see other bills that, um, oh, and we forgot to thank Nolan. Um, who just came in um, and joined fiscal. But anyway, I mean, I, I, I appreciate um, in particular our two new members who maybe have seen other committees vote out lots of bills as we have um, uh, very systematically um, looked at this. So thank you. And Representative McFawn. Yes, and Madam Chair, I just want to add to that that uh, I feel this bill is studying the right things. Mm -hmm. Before we make our final decisions, mm -hmm. um, we're doing a lot of studying. We're doing a lot of looking into things. Okay. So that's very, very important. Well, thank you. You're um, welcome. If there are no other comments, the clerk shall begin. I don't know. The clerk shall begin to call the roll. Representative Noyes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe I just go right in order as it is on this sheet. So I'll start with Representative McFawn. Yes. Sorry. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Whitman. Yes. Representative Rosenquist. I'm sorry, you're muted, Representative. Sorry about that. Yes. Representative Small? Yes. Representative Redmond? Yes. Representative Payala? Yes. Representative Gregoin? What? Representative Gregoin? You know Gregoire. that's not, he know he knows that's not my name. Oh yes. Gregoire, sorry. Oh sorry. Representative Noise, yes. Representative Brumstead? Yes. And Representative Pew. Yes. Vote is eleven zero zero. Thank you. Um thank you, committee. Um the uh along with um the joint um the fiscal note, the bill will go to the floor for notice today, I believe. And um, the clerk will connect with legislative council um, and with uh, the committee assistant, Julie Tucker, in terms of next steps. But committee, while it will be on notice, um, it will be going to another committee. Um, and uh, its last stop will be, um, the, and the, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, and the reporter um, will be um, uh, Representative Brumstead. And sorry, so um, Representative Brumstead, you will work with um, the, the clerk. The clerk takes the bill to the, <laughs> To the clerk's office, to, to, to the house clerk's office, um, but we'll take the bill, um, connect with Ledge Council in terms of that. Um, tomorrow, we will um, go to the other end of the age spectrum. Is that right, Representative Wood? Um, yes, kind of. most, mostly, not mostly. all, but mostly. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, and um, and because we're going to start working on a um, a much simpler bill, um, of which um, our goal is that we get it out by the um, end of the week. It is our second um, priority uh, area. Um, and then, Representative Noise, are we starting your bill? Um, I'm sorry. Are we start? Are we starting um, the Office of Child Advocate this this week or next week? Uh, I believe it's on the calendar for this week. Okay, we're doing that. 
Um, and um, I will be asking, it's either tomorrow or the next day, um, a member of the Appropriations Committee who wants to, uh, has a proposal for the budget. Um, Representative Iacoboni wanted to know if I approved it, what I thought of it, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not speaking for the committee. Um, so, but congratulations committee. Um, with that, um, I will see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. And this ends um, our work for the time being on um, H-171. And Representative Rumstead, um, are you something around policy and this bill right now? I'm not sure if it's policy, so that's why I raised my hand quick. I just wanted to mention that Representative Paella is going to help introduce the or report the bill on the floor. Oh, okay. And I, I didn't know if that needed to be said no. here or not. Okay. <laughs> we can, we'll figure out how we can all work that out. But okay. I would like us to um, um, allow the um, our guests to be able to leave because we are finished our um, discussion and our work on H-171 as we um, have just voted it out unanimously. Thank you very much. It ends.